Uh, we'll be looking at Hebrews. Uh, did anybody get a chance to read Hebrews through three times? Anybody? It's hard to do, isn't it? Because you've got to sit there, walk off a time. Of your, it, it, it's easier said than done. It really is. So, uh, But uh, how, has there, is there anywhere in here who has never read the book of Hebrews before? You have never read the book of Hebrews. Shane, anybody else? Okay. So just a couple. Normally when I, when I ask people that, there's normally most everybody raises their hand. So more, more of you are familiar with the book than I was anticipating. This is a good thing. Um, so uh, Hebrews is one of those books that is, uh, you could say, heaped in controversy. Um, it has a lot to say about Jesus and a lot to say about um, our Christian walk. And one of the things in Hebrews that really gets people hung up at is it has five different warning passages throughout it. Uh, these passages are, are, are warnings against uh, what happens if you leave the faith. And it brings up a lot of really important questions, such as, can you lose your salvation? A lot of times throughout, people, throughout history, Christians have answered this a lot of different ways, um, giving rise to the controversy called predestination. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. Basically, the idea is, is someone predestined to be saved, or do they have free will and choice? And Hebrews takes a look at that. <clears throat> Hebrews has a lot to do with the Old Testament law. So be as we see um, knowledge of the Bible continue to decrease in the Americas, specifically North America is the one I'm talking about, uh, you see people get less and less familiar with this kind of stuff because they don't read the Old Testament. There's kind of this idea that there's two different gods, you know, the God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament. So just causing a lot of issues there. So about the book itself, it's what's called a general epistle. Um, if you've never heard that before, uh, epistle basically just means letter. It's a big fancy word. I don't know who decided to call it epistles instead of letters. It would have done the job perfectly fine, <laughs> but I guess uh, it sounds neater if you say epistle. Um, and it's called is what's called a general epistle. Now, what a general means is it's not uh, it's not addressed to a certain specific uh, uh, location. Like there's a book in the New Testament called Galatians. It's to the church at a city in Galatia. There's Ephesus. Or, I'm sorry, Ephesians, which was written to the city the the church uh, at Ephesus. There's uh, Colossians, which was written to the city of Colossae. So there's a lot of different things like that. Well, well, Hebrews doesn't say to the church at. So it's what's called the general epistle. Um, some other examples of general epistles would be the book of James, um, first, second, and third John, although they actually were written to a specific place. Uh, Jude. So uh, general epistles written more generally. So kind of simple there, I guess. Uh, the New Testament is filled with basically two sections. There's the Gospels, which everyone knows that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then there's a series of books, and those are the epistles. Um, they are organized from the longest to the shortest with the ones that Paul wrote. So Romans is the first because it's the longest. Then it goes down to the first and second Thessalonians because those are the shortest. And then you get out of the, out of the, um, out of the letters that Paul wrote, and you get into the other ones, and it starts going from longest to shortest again, Hebrews being the longest of the uh, letters that weren't written by Paul, and Jude being the shortest of the letters that weren't written by Paul. So that's kind of how it's organized in your Bible and why it's organized like that. Um, most of the, uh, well, we'll come back to that another time. So the letter body doesn't clarify the audience. It doesn't ever say to the church at. Um, the only designation that's ever been, attest been attached to any of the manuscripts is, uh, manuscripts is a reference to uh, Hebrews, which um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll just make it kind of quick. Uh, the Jews were exiled from their homeland in the in, you know, 500s B.C. Um, they got back in by the Persians. They stayed there through the Greeks taking over, and then the Romans took over, and they were still in the place. Everything was fine. 
And they stayed there until the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD-ish, somewhere around there. And then they, the land kind of became empty again, and they didn't get their nationhood again until uh, around World War II. So uh, a, lot of things, <clears throat> a lot of things happened there. But my point in saying that is the Hebrews were really kind of spread throughout the areas. It was not like they were in one specific place. So you can't say, hey, it was written to Jerusalem. No, you can't really say that. So it doesn't really clarify. We do know a couple of things about the audience itself. Um, we know that they had a really good knowledge of the Old Testament. Um, we know that because he references things without explaining in a way that we know he know they know what nobody is talking about. The next thing is we know that these people are being tempted to return back to being Jews again because of some of the things that he talks about, um, which strongly argues that these people were Jews, especially given the fact that once again Hebrews has been attached to the to the manuscript. Um, and the concepts that are written, the way that it's written, were, were very, very common in Greek-speaking synagogues over, um, over uh, more of the, the, the traditional ones. So my point in saying that, we can kind of put all these pieces to get, together and say it was most likely written to Jewish Christians in Rome. These Jewish Christians were probably not in the Middle East. They were probably in Rome. Um, another thing that kind of solidifies that is the way that the book ends, but we'll look at that at the end of the study and uh, kind of leave that where it's at. So that's as far as where it's to. The Christians that had, it, they, they had converted largely from Judaism to Christianity, and they were in Rome. As far as who is it from, um, well, <laughs> this is something that people um, kind of argue about. I've noticed that people who don't know Greek like to say that Paul wrote it. And people who do know Greek say they know that Paul didn't write it. So I'll just start out the gate here saying Paul did not write this. Um, if you translate Paul's writings and you translate the book of Hebrews, there's, they're just so completely different. You can definitely tell the, the writer's personality when you're translating, and Hebrews is not Paul. Uh, it's, it's just not. There, there, there's no way. He, he doesn't write like this. He doesn't use these words. Um, it's just... Writing style is completely different. Um, as far as any more specific, specific than that, we're really hard pressed. Uh, some people have said maybe Barnabas, and yeah, maybe, but we can't really can't really know. Uh, we do know that whoever wrote it, it was either a person or a group of people that were first generation Christians. Um, besides that, we know that the person was very intelligent and educated, or people person or people were very intelligent and educated. But that's more or less all we can know for certain. Um, as far as church history, there's never been like a, hey, this is definitely who wrote it. Like if you look through the, the church fathers and stuff, you, you really don't find, you see a, a few different people saying a few different things, but you don't get any solid answers. Um, so then that takes us to when, oh, when was this book written? Well, <laughs> This is a little bit of a game, trying to figure this out. But there's a couple of things that point us in the right direction. We can safely assume that it was before 70 AD. The reason for that is found in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 26 to 27. It says, His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken. And so that kind of seems to imply the idea that Jerusalem has not yet been destroyed. Because throughout the whole book, he's talking about how Jesus is better than the angels, better than the law, better than the priest, all these different things. Why, oh why, would he have never brought up the fact that Jerusalem had been destroyed? That would have been like a perfect end to his argument about how Jesus is better than the Mosaic Law. So, you know, th there's, there's that, but that's not really something that's explicitly stated. But also, we know that um, we can safely assume that it was before 64 a uh, AD 
because Nero, Emperor Nero's persecution began in 64. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, it says, And struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So we can assume from these two passages that Emperor Nero has not started killing the Christians and Jerusalem has not yet been destroyed. So that would once again argue for before 64. As far as how late, I mean, what's the earliest it could be? Well, we know it was written after Jesus in the 30s AD. So that right there, we've got a 30-year window. But we, I think we can kind of get a little bit closer because there was an emperor. His name was Emperor Claudius. And Emperor Claudius uh, confiscated Christian property and gave him generally just a hard time. And, uh, but that, those laws that he was enforcing against the Christians in Rome were repealed when he died. He died in 50, 54. And uh, so probably more than likely it was after he died because a comment that is written here in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Remember the earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you, you be, got saved, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. And then he says this, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions, and at other times you were companions of those who uh, were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions because you know that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. That, once again, isn't definite, but it, definitely, it seems to imply that it's after Claudius has confiscated the property. So with that, we can kind of put all those things together and say it was probably written in the early 60s. If I had to guess, 61 to 63. More specifically, I think that's kind of a, a realistic window. But, uh, I mean, obviously that's up for debate. It's not really something that's definite. This is how it is. Some more things about... Um, about the book of Hebrews, its main idea that it has going throughout the whole book, the whole thing, it, there's this idea that just keeps repeating over and over and over again, keep growing. Keep growing. There's just over and over again, over again. If you could summarize it, I mean, this is just, there's no better way to, to say what the book of Hebrews says than don't revert. You, you, guys, were, you guys were Jews. You got saved. Don't go back to being Jews. Don't, don't go backwards. Jesus is the answer. Keep sticking with Jesus. Things are hard, yes, especially in Rome. was probably, the, probably whenever things got hard for Christians, it seemed like it always started in Rome. <laughs> but, so yes, things were definitely hard. Uh, losing your property, uh, getting beaten. These are things that are, that are very hard. Um, and in fact, there were some, a group of, of them that were um, more or less exiled. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, you read about them in the book of Acts. Um, these were some of the people that had been um, displaced by Emperor Claudius. So, um, that, 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 that theme of just don't revert, don't revert. And as you go through the book, you find these five different warning passages throughout it about what happens if you go back to Judaism. Um, and it just keeps going back and forth. Jesus is better than this. This is what happens if you go back to Judaism. Jesus is better than this. This is what happens if you go back to Judaism. Five different times it goes through the cycle of repetition throughout the whole book. And um, so it just goes from uh, an argument that's called from lesser to greater. If this, then how much more that? So if the law didn't do this, then how much more will the presence of God, you know, with the new kingdom do this? And so kind of that idea of lesser to greater. And, and you'll, you'll kind of pick up on it as you read through the book. Uh, the next thing is uh, um, it, it goes through all the main Jewish motives uh, that, you know, Jewish people were really focused on and kind of uh, rebuts them one by one. Uh, it goes through, um, let's see, um, angels, Moses, uh, the law, the priesthood, and the Holy Land. Um, so it just goes through all those different things there. Uh, I already mentioned it does compare contrast going from lesser to greater. And really, juxtapos juxt juxtaposition between the Old Testament law and the New Testament the Testament always just kind of goes back and forth there. Uh, so with that being said, the writing style is very unique. 
Um, it's, it's not something that we have any other ancient uh, copy, uh, uh, ver no, uh, examples of. There are no other ancient examples like this. It was written not as a letter like Paul writes. It was written as an ancient sermon. So this is, the ser this is what their sermons looked like in first century Christianity. How amazing is that? We get to go back in time and see what it was like when, when they preached back then. I mean, I think that's really cool. I mean, it's a little long. I think I probably would have fallen asleep. But, you know, still, it's, it's good to see the content there. Um, and, and we know that it's written as a sermon more so than a letter because of some of the words that he uses and how those words are also used in other books of the Bible. I won't bore you with the details, but that's uh, the main idea there is that um, it is written as a sermon. So uh, a couple last notes that I want to mention about this. Um, there are some differences in the quotes that he uses between the Old Testament that you have and how it's quoted in the book of Hebrews. Don't, listen, don't let this worry you too much. He was quoting an Old Testament that was called the Septuagint. Um, that's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, and so it reads a little bit different. Um, they rely on a little bit different manuscripts. But it gets the same point across. It's just that it's going to be worded slightly different. Um, another thing is that, and I mentioned this on Sunday night, uh, New Testament authors, when they quote the Bible, the Old Testament, I mean, uh, they oftentimes will quote a concept over precision. So they won't necessarily be concerned with getting it word for word exact, just as long as you get the idea of what's being said. You know what I mean? And that was kind of their main focus. Uh, once again, totally foreign to how we do things now, but um, you shouldn't look to it and think, oh, they made a mistake or the Bible isn't you know, inerrant or something like that. No, it is inerrant. It's just that uh, they had a different concept of quoting than we do. Um, have, have, for instance, have you ever noticed in the Gospels, Jesus talks different in the book of John than he does in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? That's because that's how you quoted people back then. You didn't try to go for precision of words. You got, tried to go for precision of content. So in the Gospel of John, that's not really how Jesus talked. He didn't say those exact words in the Gospel of John. John is writing it in a way to get the point of what Jesus said across. Before you get to Ben Asheva about that, that is how they did biographies in the ancient world. That's just how they did it. This idea of trying to be precise on everything, they would have laughed at you. They would have said, why, why would you do that? Like history, right now, there's this, there's kind of this fad in history that they're trying to be objective in history. That's impossible. You cannot possibly have objective history. But they still pursue this, this, this dream of, of having zero bias in history books nowadays. And uh, in the old world, old world, they never would have tried to do something like that. If, his, if you couldn't hurt, learn from history, they would have said, why even bring it up then? The whole point of history was to be commentated. So, you know, it's one of those things where you just can't hold it to modern standards. And that's pretty much it. Um, in the book of Hebrews, we do find a very full picture of Jesus um, and, and things that really aren't discussed too much. How many times have you heard people talk about what and who Jesus was before he was Jesus? You don't. You hear the Mormons talk about how he was created. <laughs> you hear some other cults talk about how he's not really God or not fully God. But you don't really ever hear from a Christian perspective who is Jesus before he was Jesus? He just doesn't even come up. And uh, the book of Hebrews brings it up. And uh, it's a very good, very good thing. Definitely something worth looking at. Obviously, it's in the Bible. So, As far as lessons, what can it teach us today? I, I think the book of Hebrews has a lot of applications um, as a whole. Uh, one of the things that I think Hebrews kind of emphasizes is that anybody can fall. Anybody can mess up. There is no person alive who is above temptation and above failure. They don't exist. Anybody can fall. You can let sin in. You can get caught up in somebody else's sin. You can, I mean, things happen. You know what I mean? I've seen perfectly devoted Christian pastors who, who love the Lord get caught up in adultery. I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. I, I've seen, you know... Really good, really good people who, who got caught up in scandals and, and, and financial problems in their church. I've seen it. 
anybody can mess up. And when you start having this idea of I'm above it, that's exactly when you set yourself up for failure. And in the book of Hebrews, it, it doesn't say, hey, you're above sin. It never once says that. Rather, it says, take care, <laughs> lest this spring up inside of you. So definitely something we can all uh, learn from. Be on your guard because, you know, you don't want to let. My, my mom used to always say this, don't, don't, don't give the devil a foothold in your heart. And I think I, I think I couldn't say it any better myself, so I'll, I'll quote her. <laughs> don't let the devil have a foothold in, in your life. It happens very subtly. Um, starts with just somebody says something that they shouldn't have, and then you get upset, and then you let it fester, and then you get a bad attitude, and just before you know it, the whole tree is corrupted. And it, it happens. And it happens to the best of us. Don't think that, oh, you know, if, if I allow the fact that I could mess up, I'm less of a Christian. No. <laughs> No, 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 it makes you more of a Christian <laughs> to admit that you, you know, can mess up and that you can, can sin. So uh, another lesson that I think we've learned from Hebrews is to live intentionally. Life is not guaranteed. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Live intentionally. Um, you know, Satan desires to destroy you. And every second, I think, I think most of the time we, we mute this. Every second of every day, Satan wants to destroy you. He wants you to fail. Everything is in an aspect a spiritual warfare. I'm not saying demons are making you do stuff. That's all I'm saying. But I am saying that Satan will use just about anything to get you off of Jesus. And the big lesson that we see in Hebrews is focus on Jesus. And I think that's a really good lesson that we can all learn from. Um, so, Bill, uh, you know, keep, keep your gaze ahead. Um, a third lesson that I think we can get from, from Hebrews is, is uh, you know, the spiritual warfare all the time. And um, with that being said, you kind of have to start thinking about what you're thinking about, what's going on in your head. Start thinking about um, your life problems. When, when a problem comes up, stop seeing it as, oh, that's just a life problem. See it like this. This problem that came up is an opportunity for me to trust God or for me to let Satan win in my life. When you start looking at it like that, it changes the game. It changes the game. It's not, oh, I just, you know, it's okay if I flip this driver off because he's driving like an idiot. It's, ah, yet another opportunity for me to lose my, my, my witness. You know, and you start seeing all these little, uh, little things throughout your life, and I think it really, you know, has something to show us there. Um, next week, we'll start looking at chapter 1. Um, I don't want these lessons to go real long because they're going to be very in-depth, especially as we start talking about the nature of Jesus and who he is. What I've found is that the more you talk about what the Bible says about Jesus, the more you find out that you didn't really see him for who he really is. You don't know how many times I, I've done a Bible study and I've thought, wow, I didn't realize that about Jesus. That's interesting. And then I'll teach it, and, and without, without a doubt, there's at least one to three people, and every single time I, I, ta I teach about Jesus, who come up and say, I never, I never knew that. There's a lot of people who don't realize, but in their mind, they've degraded Jesus from God to something lesser. You know what I mean? And I think part of that is due to how well the cults are doing in, in the communities. It seems like Jehovah's Witness on, is on the rise. It seems like Mormonism is on the rise. And the more those things are on the rise and enter entertainment is becoming the theological instruction and people really aren't reading their Bibles much anymore, the more that kind of stuff happens, I think you're going to see people more and more not really sure of who Jesus is. We live in a, in, a, in a day and age where there's a lot of information out there and a lot of it's not really true. So, like, if you go on YouTube and Facebook and stuff, you're going to see a lot of videos where people are saying things um, about... I just watched a video today on Facebook, and the guy who was a, who was a pastor, he was talking about the way that you didn't have to uh, believe in Jesus or that believe that Jesus was God to be saved. You just had to follow his examps, example of how he lived his life because it was just about being a better person. And... Uh, so basically what he was saying is you're saved by works. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's so original. If somebody hadn't thought of that 2,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, this, these are the times, that we live in a time now where 
you really have to watch very close, careful watch on your, on your theology because it's very easy to be uh, misled. And you really have to go back to Scripture um, on everything, really. Um, okay, and uh, besides that, next week we will start looking at, um, at Hebrews chapter 1. So if you want to know more of what's going on, going on in, in Hebrews, I uh, once again I recommend you guys read through Hebrews three times this week. And that'll really give you a good idea of the the flow of the argument. Because uh, remember these these Old Testament, um, I'm sorry, these New Testament letters, they were meant to be read in one sitting. So when you break it up into numerous days, you kind of lose the flow of what's being said. And uh, that's really all I got for tonight. But uh, if you'll join me in prayer, Lord, I uh, I pray that you'd guide us and direct us. Uh, Really, throughout these 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 last days, God, there's there's a lot of opportunity for witnessing, and there's a lot of opportunity for being offended, and there is a lot of opportunity to, for being sidetracked. Lord, I pray you'd help us to stay focused on you, um, even as Hebrews prom- prompts us not to get full of ourselves, like we could never fail, but to just tune in on Jesus and to know Jesus has it under control. Help us to put you first in all things, God. I, I pray that you would impress on everybody's heart who's here tonight, Lord, that you'd um, just impress on them a nation to pray for and uh, a nation that they can really, really hopefully even go and serve at maybe someday, but uh, a nation that they can really be um, keep up on and, and read about and, and learn about and pray for, uh, that they would that they would make, make a kingdom impact on that nation, Lord. Uh, and we thank you for everything you're doing in us and through us. Uh, amen.